Welcome to Really with Tom and Dave. There. Ugh. I mean, you We're do a little all chippy. The, all the, We're a little you, chippy you, you today. Do. Well, I'm saying you. I mean, that's my one job. That's my one. Job. <laughs> no. You do, you you do, all, the, you do all the research and intros, and I just do the hello. Oh, that's it. God, why do I, I want to do all the research and intro? I mean, we can we can change it up, man. I, no, listen. I don't want to. No, no. I like the way it is. <laughs> I, like I like your lighting. This distribution of work. Thank I like you. your lighting. How's yeah, it going well, over there? That yeah, lighting. I'm just. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to make my. You know, just my. Uh, you know. Head not not flare so much, uh, <laughs> right? With, with well, my, yeah, with my fluorescent white hair. The purple with, is working. With my built-in it's... bounce kit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, no. Now you look you look completely like cool, mellow. You look like the bartender of Club Tattoo or some kind of you know exotic locale. You've got oh, some that'd be nice. Drinks. Well, there's the a lot of booze behind me, so that that's I know, of that, I, guess. I know, get making me I'm thirsty. Um, I. Uh, a little bit of I'm a little behind the times, but I finished with Christina and I finished Fargo and Oh you um, did. Ah. And I'm gonna join the chorus of saying like that was really good. It was really, really good. It was really like I mean Great we also show. crushed the last episode. Like we were it like it hits a new rail and so we were just jamming. It was uh really fun. Uh it was yeah. very sad to see you go. I was really <laughs> enjoying your spoiler. performance. There may be some hmm? people out there who haven't seen it yet. No, oh, I know, but we've we've already spoiled this ending multiple times on oh, this have podcast. We? Okay, so, yes. Yeah. What he's ref- have. You're, you're you're referring to when my character packs his his bindle on a stick and hobos mm-hmm. it on a freight train okay. out of town. Hops on the train and is out. Yeah. You know, Mark Twain to style Mark, or well, well, Boxcar Willie plays. Um, yes, uh, but uh, it was great. But, what a nice thing to be a part of. What great! It's a, just oh, a, it's such a great show. Yeah, it's any really great cast right. and. Now yeah. I have to catch and, up with other episodes, but it was was a and, damn good cast. And I made a real I made a real point of not reading the last script, the final script, because I I wanted oh. didn't want to know how it ended. Because oh, wow. uh, so I didn't know till I till I watched it. So that it was the first there were surprises for me when I we got. To Where the did they episode. find that monk guy? I, I mean, he was amazing. He's fantastic, Steve Spruill from England. He's a tr- just a f- really great actor and uh, and a really lovely fellow. Not at all like his character. I was really, I found it all thrilling, interesting, just fascinating and loved the performances, but was then just very moved by that last episode. Just that last, yes. just even that it's last a, 10 minutes. It's It does something that you don't get often from Fargo. It is a, a positive, a life affirming message about, about the value of decency. And kindness. I didn't see it. Didn't see it coming. Yeah. I think Noah, yeah, Noah Hawley, you know, got, you know, allowed real sentiment to come through. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was really well done. Juno Temple is amazing. Yeah. John Hamm was great. Jennifer Jason Leigh was amazing. You were it was you yeah. were amazing. It was great. So good on you. Thank you. It was well really done. fun. It took yeah. me a while, but I'm I'm here to say everybody out there get to yeah. Fargo season five. Um, and I, in the meantime, we have a fa- fascinating uh, guest. Uh, we do but, an actual, uh, an actually well, an informed and literate uh, author on the subject. Extraordinarily informed. Um, let me give you a little bit of the rundown on uh, Mr. Graham Rendell, uh, who is a full-time author and a commentator on the unidentified aerial phenomenon, the UAP subject. He's also a contributor to the Debrief, an American news website dealing with cutting edge science, tech and defense news and a guest on various podcasts like this one dealing with the UAP. And he's a member of the UAP Media UK group advocating government transparency on the UAP issue. Um, Graham has written a critically acclaimed work looking at the Foo Fighters witnessed during World War II and the numerous wartime cases that occurred before the term was coined in November 1944, as well as other books dealing with aerial UFO encounters between 1946 and 1954. He has been an aviation and World War II history enthusiast from an early age when he was given model aircraft kits to keep him quiet. Uh, Married to Joe, he lives in Upper Weardale, a quiet but picturesque part of County Durham. And uh, we welcome him to Really. Hello. There he is. How are you? I'm I know, fine. And, and th- Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for staying up so late. I apologize. Oh, don't don't apologize, David. It's just part of the territory. Um, we, we, you know, there's lots of invitations from people on the west coast, etc. So it's it just you know it's just one of those things you have to do. I'm afraid. So uh, don't worry about it. 
we're very they, sorry they, to keep you up so late, but yes. we're going to make it worth your while. Yeah. How? I'll, I'll hold it to that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, he just made a promise. I'm not sure we can really follow through <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, well, uh, he's made the promise, uh, Dave. You haven't. So yeah, you're, you're I, sort I, of like absolved. No, Dave's, yeah. a, Dave's a part of this now. Dave's, I rely on Dave for the fascinating <laughs> part. Um, oh. Yes, we are. Well, we are actually thrilled to have you. I am. I'm. Yes. I am neck deep in in both UFOs before Roswell, with the European Foo Fighters book that covers 1940 to 1945, um, as well as the 1950 and 1952 book. And I'm ah. overwhelmed by the the volume of I'm the sightings. Just that how how many? First of all, it's just beautifully documented. I mean, there's multiple. Um, you know, witnesses in many cases dealing with with pilots um, in in their own words in many cases uh, reminds me in some cases of Leslie Kane's book about you know which just dealing with were just credible witnesses, uh, extraordinary encounters. Why were you drawn to this period? Like, what do you, what kind of compelled you to to document? Uh, this is great for history it was great for people interested in the topic it's it's a great record that i don't know exists anywhere else but what what drew you to it well as as you mentioned in in the intro i'm i'm a long standing aviation enthusiast um apart from ufo's I also have a, an interest in world war 2 and and all three things really go back you know more than 40 years so when and you say that you're reading the ufo's before roswell the foo fighters book and that's the one i started with um, and all those interests came together to write that book. And I felt it was a book that maybe needed to be written as well, um, because the, the previous sort of you know, works I've seen on the Foo Fighters, while some of them were really good, they didn't seem to have um, a huge amount of context in terms of what was happening around the sightings and maybe explaining them in, in you know, a bit more about the airplanes involved um, and where they were and what they were doing and all this kind of stuff. So I felt that there was a bit more information that, that an audience could you know, could benefit from to tell the story. But there's also things like exploding the Nazi saucer myth. That's part of the book as well. And a lot of other things that have, have basically built up around the Foo Fighters that are, are now longstanding. You know, if you tell something long and hard enough, it'd become a fact on the internet when it's nothing of the sort. So I felt those things needed to be explored as well. But then just moving on from that, because a lot of those cases were aerial cases, so you know, people flying uh, in right. fighters or bombers, et cetera, who were meeting these strange objects, then I felt that I could just continue that story on and tell the story of aerial encounters, um, but in bite-sized chunks. So the first book was 46 to 49. Then, as he said, you're reading the 50 to 52 book. But then there's three, there's, you know, two of the books in the series after that, one which I've just released for 55 to 56. So, yeah, it, it's building up into a bit of a, a, um, a bit of a series now. And that's yeah. effectively and, and, what I'm doing most of the time. I'm just writing yeah. those books. And the new one is called, is it called Chasing Shadows? Is it the new one? Chasing Shadows, that's right. Yeah, it's got yes. a forward by Bryce Zabel. So the, the, co the covers behind me. Um, so I've got a couple of friends oh, who nice. uh, come up with these amazing covers. Oh, that's I just the give cover. them a oh, case beautiful. and say, "Yeah, you know, just come up with the case, Dan Olaf," and that's what they do. They come up with these amazing renditions. Yeah, well, and, and I know I actually had lunch with Bryce Sable just a little while ago. He's a lovely man, and uh, yeah, it's he certainly is. a great resource for the community. Yeah, I met him at Roswell last year. Uh, I was asked to go and speak at the conference uh, at the end of June, beginning of July. And Bryce was another one of the speakers. And he was just, just seemed to be a kind of kindred spirit and some, somebody who spoke a lot of sense on the subject, who was asking the right questions, um, you know, didn't sort of fall into the kind of rabbit holes that, you know, exist in this topic. Uh, he was just a really, really no-nonsense, very, very sensible and very approachable guy. Um, and it was it was great to spend some time with them, not just at the speaker's meals, but in the hotel as well, you know, before or after the conferences, just having these real long form conversations about all and sundry. It was it was brilliant. Um, and as somebody who really enjoyed his Dark Skies uh, TV show back in the 1990s, it was it was a, yeah, it was a kind of dream come true just to meet a co producer of that program. So, yeah, it was brilliant. I know. I, w I wish I could find somewhere that's streaming the series. I know you can stream the uh, the pilot movie for it right now, yeah. but I can't find I can't find the series anywhere. But if if people can find it, it's really worth watching. I need to see it. Definitely. Um, yeah. Well, I the, the, just about World War II for a minute because you mentioned German tech. There were some really mm. 
fascinating portrayals of just what it was like for a pilot to fly over Germany at night, an Allied pilot, and and sort of the the various pressures and tensions on that pilot. Can you and and so just a general fog of war feeling I got about like how yeah. it could have affected reporting of UAP. Can you talk about some of those? I guess in, in some cases, maybe just talk about what a what a pilot was dealing with and why it was maybe hard to get. Uh, you know, or why it was so hard to get research on this subject and, and how you how you managed to do that. So I try to set the context in terms of um, how the bomber crews were operating because they they provide a lot of the reports on this subject during World War Two. And then later, the U.S. Um, Army Air Force night fighter crews who were based in in uh, France and Belgium and northern Italy, they experienced the same kind of things. So they're all under the same effect of pressure that you know, you're flying in the dark, um, you're firing against enemy defenses, so you're being shot at by anti-aircraft guns, but also you're you know, in the glare of searchlights, which then attract the, gu the guns as well, but also they have night fighters flying to try and shoot you down. So there's all, you know, you're being attacked in all different ways. There's always that ever present fear that you're going to be attacked. And anything in the sky that might be a light, something out of the ordinary is of interest. So you have, you've got, you know, maybe six, seven, sometimes more highly trained observers in an airplane. And basically all they're doing is just looking out, out of any window, any gun turret to see what is coming in their direction. Um, or they're looking out to the side of the airplane, they're looking behind them, they're looking up front, they're looking above, you know, you name it, they're looking elsewhere. Um, RAF, RAF aircraft, the, initially in the war, they weren't fit, were much in the way of um, guidance systems or bombing aids or electronics. That came a bit later, but then it became a cat, an electronic cat and mouse game between the, them and the Germans. So everybody was, you know, they were inventing stuff to defeat radar or to make radar better or to be able to drop their bombs on target much more effectively. Um, and then there was uh, what they called homing devices. So the um, enemy night fighters could home in on emissions by uh, from um, RAF bomber, you know, uh, radar systems for, for dropping bombs or for uh, early warning radar uh, that they had fitted to actually def to detect the approach of night fighters. The Germans developed uh, you know, systems which could actually home in on those um, things that were supposed to keep the bomber crew safe. Now, when mm. it came to the Americans flying in Europe, they had the similar pressures, but they were flying in the daytime. So it was a different sort of scenario in terms of the German fighters because there were a lot more of them flying, the, the daytime fighters. They were coming in in huge swarms. Um, and if anybody's seen the Masters of the Air documentary uh, that's on Apple at the moment, then I know I want to. I uh, hear it's, it's great. It's not quite a faithful re rendition of of air attacks because there's far too many aircraft and they're, and they're really grouped together in terms of the German fighters. But it, it's it's sort of you know it's sort of spot on in terms of the damage that you can inflict to a bomber just by one particular aircraft. So you know there was a lot of pressures, a lot of stress. But also stress leads to people seeing things when they may not be there or reporting the least bit thing that they see and blowing it out of proportion. However, a lot of things were seen as well, which just defy explanation. Um, and they did catalog them. They're in the mission reports, these things that they see. It's not just the, the Foo Fighters, which is a phenomenon uh, which started at the end of 1944. If you go all the way back to 1940, the summer 1940, in the, in the RAF Bomber Command's intelligence documents, you will see that they started a fairly extensive month-by-month -month analysis, uh, analysis of lights that followed bombers. Um, now, they, at the time, they thought they were German night fighters, but some, in some cases, they were following these bombers for 250 miles, which is a long way to follow something without opening fire or doing something else. You know, what's the point? So um, over a period of about two years, they tried to work out what these things were. And at the end of the day, they just gave up because they didn't know. And now in some cases... And I'm sorry to interrupt Graham and that there's a slight delay, but in some cases they were they did open fire, correct? Like there was there was some reports, oh, yeah. and I don't know if it was the RFA pilots, but there was reports of just the bullets just going into these or explain to what, what some of those interactions were. So the story that you're talking about happened in March 1942, and it's a it's a RAF bomber coming back from a raid on Essen in, in the Ruhr in Germany, 
Um, and it's a, Pol- it's a Polish crew on board. Um, it's right, 301 the Squadron. They're based in, in Lincolnshire in, in England. And they're coming back from the bombing raid. And over Holland, the, the tail gunner of this twin engine aircraft, a Wellington bomber, he then shouts over the intercom, there's a, there's, a light, you know, there's a light coming up behind us. And it was just an orange disc, basically. That's what it was reported at as. Um, now, anything like that, anything out of the ordinary, well, it's going to be a German night fighter, or at least that was the feeling back then that you know anything right. coming behind an air, air, a bomber would be something coming to shoot you down. So the, the pilot radios back and says, look, you know, if it gets close enough within range, open fire at it, which would be standard procedure anyway. Um, and the, the gunner did open fire at it, and he's got four machine guns and his tail turret, um, and he fires at this thing. Every 10th round is a tracer, so it's um, a, phosphorescent, uh, a phosphorescent bullet, which means you can see where the bullet goes, um, so that, you know, that helps with their aiming. Um, and the bullets go into this disc, this red, uh, this orange light, and nothing happens. They don't go out the other side. Uh, the the disc doesn't you know blow up. It doesn't fall away in flames. It doesn't try to evade. The bullets just go into it. It then moves around to the wingtip of the airplane. It sits off the wingtip of the bomber, and you know it sits there for a bit as the bomber's flying through the sky. Um, and then after a little while, still the gun it was firing at it as all the time it was moving around. It then moves around to a to a point off the nose of the airplane, and the nose gun is firing at it as well by that point, and it's just. For one of a better ex- expression, it's absorbing the bullets because they're not going anywhere. They're just disappearing into it. And that's not a German aeroplane because if that was the case, it would have been riddled full of holes or it would have caught fire or it would have exploded or it would have, it, it would have, the pilot would have evaded um, the, you know, the bullets. So it then, after a while, uh, the, the aircraft flying through the sky, maybe 200 miles an hour or so, this thing's keeping stationed some distance ahead. It then just shoots off at 45 degrees in, into the heavens and disappears. When they're back on the ground, of course, the crew are talking to the intelligence officers in the debrief uh, afterwards, where that happened every mission, didn't matter what happened. You know, what are the defences like? Have you dropped your bombs on time? Did you see anything out the unusual? You know, this kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, and they mention this. And of course, the 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 initial response is, you know, have you been drinking, old man? You know, kind of thing. You know, are you are you are you trying to get off flying? Are you trying to be, pretend you're mad? They, all this kind of stigma, that, which is, you know, w- which was also prevalent back then. That wasn't a thing that just started in the 1950s, uh, with airliner pilots and with military pilots getting this kind of stigma for UFOs. Um, but they were saved effectively by a crew of an aircraft behind them in the bomber formation, um, which is like a loose string of airplanes. It wasn't really a, a tight formation like the, the daytime raids that the Americans did. Uh, you're talking about a gaggle of maybe 200, 300 aircraft s- along a long string, maybe you know, 40, 50 miles long. So you can see how they're well dispersed. But this aircraft behind them in, in, the, in the stream actually said, you know, the, the pilot said, we saw that thing as well. So, you know, it's one of those stories where there's no official documentation, just the pilot testimony. But other ones do have um, do have actually some kind of paperwork with them. Uh, there's, a, there's a story from November of that year, 42, where there was a, um, a British bomber flying over northern Italy on its way to bomb an engine factory in Turin. Um, and they come across this 200 or 300 foot long torpedo shaped object and they see it twice. First time is at an altitude. Second time, it's down in the mountain valley, flying along between the mountain peaks, and and that's a story, funny enough, which I've you know delved into the pilot's history because a lot of these stories, when you see um, previous published accounts about Foo Fighters and things like that, there wasn't much kind of research around the edges to see you know what you know the, the history of the pilots and the, the aircraft and the and the bases and the air, and all this kind of stuff uh, and that's the kind of thing that i do to try and bring a little bit more kind of um sort of context to the to this the case as well rather than just the, the bare bones that you see often if you see them ri- written about on the internet or in other books so yeah so that's the kind of thing i do mm-hmm. and you keep answering questions before i can get to them um yeah <laughs> sorry dave <laughs> <laughs> no that's all right it's really informative but yeah that was, was... two ronnie's sketch in the uk uh, the <laughs> oh, oh, the two i love yeah, the two ronnie's the, 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 Whoa. Do you remember the mastermind the, the quiz game for the uk and it was answering the question before last that was a specialist <laughs> subject yeah yeah <laughs> but no because i was going to say i was because i was curious as to whether or not the stigma uh like whether there would be more reporting and more uh, of a paper trail on things 
uh, during the war because they would be they would have to consider the possibility of it being an, an adversary. Um, oh, of course, yeah. I mean, so ev- the, everything was written down after a raid, and if you look at the squad, the official squadron uh, records and the mission reports, you find them not just for the Americans, but you find them for the British as well. In London, the National Archives have an extensive, you know, sort of collection of each squadron. So whether it's a fighter squadron or a transport squadron or a bomber squadron, anti-submarine squadron, you can read all the you know the day-to-day mission reports, and some of these things do crop up. They're not very detailed, and it all de- and it was quite patchy. Some of the squadrons had very little information. Um, So you were lucky if you got one kind of paragraph for an entire squadron for an entire raid, whereas other ones, you might have a bit more. And then the really good ones, the the, the clerk who would be in charge of writing all this information down would actually have uh, an individual kind of summary for each aircraft on each raid, you know, for every day in each month. So you get a whole lot of information that you could look through to find these particular um, these cases of, you know, things that we would call UFOs nowadays. Um, back then, of course, you know, extraterrestrials, UFOs, all that kind of flying saucers, that wasn't a term that they used. It wasn't even on their radar. So none of the kind of analysis from back then you know, suggests this is out of anything out of the ordinary beyond, beyond it's a German secret weapon or something that they haven't, you know, that's been built that they haven't come across yet. So, you know, nothing that we think of today, that that just wasn't, you know, what they were sort of considering. Um, and at the end of the day, when they finally got to the end of the war and it was like, well, what these, what were these things? They were just kind of wrote them off as being jet fighters or flak rockets, you know, pretty mundane things but all the, these lights and stuff they were flying around in circles in the aircraft they were following them they, they, they couldn't be evaded in some respects and in yeah. others as we've already discussed they were shot at and didn't fall out of the sky well they're not german yeah. airplanes so and yeah and and they and the yeah the bullets didn't proceed through it like it wasn't it wasn't yeah, just a light right. or some people and, say and a plasma or yeah, and your stigma, I mean, you mentioned about stigma there. Um, mm-hmm. Another squadron, 43 Squadron, which was a fighter squadron um, based out in the North Africa in 43, in the spring of that year, their pilots, one by one, because they were flying night intruder missions over German lines, and one by one, their pilots were seeing what they called the thing. That was their name for it back then. And it was effectively what the Americans then later called the Foo Fighters, because mm. these were lights that just followed the airplanes and they would evade them or try to you know, evade the maneuvers and they couldn't shake them from either their tail or their wingtip. And the stigma was that initially the first pilots who saw it, they were written off as being, you know, kind of mad or, or you're making up stories, you know, all this kind of stuff. And just objects of ridicule on the squadron. I mean, it was banter. It was, you know, it was, some of it was lighthearted, but other times it wasn't. But one by one, the squadron pilot saw it. And obviously, you know, it, it became really serious then. So it was something they couldn't make a joke of. But yeah, in, in a lot of the times in the squadrons, if you saw something strange and you reported it, you were you were the butt of jokes for ages afterwards because, oh, that's the guy who saw that light and it didn't appear, you know, th- this kind of stuff. So yeah, it was, the stigma yeah. started early. Yeah, but it, but it wasn't an, it was an official and institutionalized stigma yet. It wasn't. Uh, no, sort of, no, yeah. it was just that that kind of banter that the the, the pilots, British, American, probably German as well, if they saw these as well. It's the kind of ca- you know, camaraderie and the lighthearted, but then not so lighthearted kind of you know interactions that they had. Mm-hmm. You know, it amazes me that there's because you you have this um, uh, an article in the debrief. Uh, we we had we had Alex Dietrich on and we're getting her account of the Tic Tac and it just amazes mm. me that that uh, sort of iconography of you know th- this this these this character of some of these ships goes back to you know that that wasn't just seen in two thousand and four or you know no. it, it was tell, can you tell us about what what seems like maybe the first official re- record of the of the tic tac because i think it's just really cool that these these ships or whatever we see you know there's there's one that's seen with this these weird traits and they're ridiculed for that and then you realize oh wait it was reported back all these decades ago so I, can you just tell us a little bit about what might be the first recorded tic tac event 
Well, I mean, tic tac. It, it's a it's a it's a new word or a new phrase for a, maybe an old object. I mean, if if you guys ever read you know sort of UFO books from the sixties and seventies, you'll have come across the phrase cigar shaped object. Right. You know, that, that's the thing that used to always appear in those books. You know, I remember from when I first started reading books in the, in the mid 1970s um, on this subject. So that was a, you know, they might as well be Tic Tacs from the shape, uh, how it's described. But then there were torpedo shaped objects. The one I mentioned before, the one over northern Italy in 1942. So that's a, you know, although it's a lot bigger and the Tic Tac that Alex Dietrich came across, I think that was, uh, I think I'm sure they said that was, was a 57 or 47 feet long, one of the two anyway. So mm -hmm. probably maybe, you know, a, a quarter of the size of the one that was seen over uh, over northern Italy. So there's an early for, um, sort of case. But I guess if you go back to the airship sightings of the late 1890s, then the shape of those could be just, you know, construed as a tic tac as well. But just by the way, you know, things are explained in the language of the time. So... Mm -hmm. The guy, the people back there who saw them would think, well, they're airships because people were experimenting with airships, albeit not as sophisticated as the ones that were reported in America at that time. Uh, but you know, there's an early version as well, and of course, there were mystery airships in the in the nineteen in the very in the first uh, decade of the nineteen hundreds as well that were seen over Britain and Europe, etc. So you have early iterations of them there as well. So yeah, you can go way back and not just World War Two, you can go even further back to, to see, you know, sort of uh, sightings of these these things that may or may not be the same object, or, or just slightly different in scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know at, at some point, they, were, they would be referred to as uh, propane tank, flying propane tanks, propane tanks, yeah, butane tanks. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 And well, I guess they did. Well, they didn't. The mints didn't exist then, which is unfortunate for everyone at the time. Uh, they liked the, you know, they didn't get the good nickname for their UFOs and they had dreadful breath. No, they, didn't. Uh, <laughs> they didn't have multiple solutions. Exactly. Yeah. But it's yeah, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, it does it does seem like. Uh, like every every time uh, we think we're experiencing something new in this field, uh, you, you realize that mm -hmm. it's that it's been. Uh, it's been repeated and just been described differently throughout history. Yeah, I think that's the importance of like, you know, sort of historical cases. You know, some people occasionally say to me, well, why are you concentrating on the old stuff? It's been done to death. Well, actually, it hasn't, because a lot of stuff that, you know, I've come up with in some of these books, people won't have read about those before. They might, they might have come across them in, in a book from years ago, but the way that they were reported in the books that I used to read, you know, the same books I, I mentioned before, you were looking if you've got a paragraph or a couple of lines about an incident. It was always... I need to move on to the next bit. And, and the author would be just putting lots of cases in, but very, very little data. And you wouldn't get the kind of um, the long form, like look at the intelligence documents around the case and all the rest of it. So I felt that was really important to just to basically throw everything that there was about the case itself, all the reporting, all the analysis that I could find and say, well, look, this is all the information to do with this case. You as a reader, make your mind up as to what's happening here rather than me just putting a few lines about a case down and, and then the next one, the next one, and then trying to write a narrative to say, this is what I think's happening, or this is what I believe's happening. Um, and actually, then I'll, I'll look at it and think, well, actually, no, it's nothing of the sort. You're just making this up. Um, I've read lots of books like that as well. So I just wanted to actually let the reader decide. Um, you know, I give them the tools to do it, but then it's up to them what they come up with at the end of the day. And, and it seems like it's a really great sort of way that, that you're sort of taking that, that er, well, call it early history, but it's the, I get, let's hmm. call it the recent early history of UFOs. <laughs> and, you're, and you're taking slices of it uh, that, and sort of taking a deeper look at all these slices of, of different points in history, yeah. um, which is a great counter to the people who, who who constantly are saying, well, there's just, there's never been any evidence. There's zero evidence. Um, whereas there's been waves of evidence going, going back to certainly oh, yeah. to the war yeah. time, to the war years and just waves and waves of it and, and waves and waves of people not paying attention. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a difference obviously though, between evidence and proof. So yeah. that's, you know, we still haven't got to the proof stage 
I mean, some people say we have. Um, you know, I'm still waiting for it myself. But evidence, yeah, there's a lot of evidence which suggests that there's definitely something happening. Uh, it's been going on for a long, long time. A lot of people say it's, have seen it, as you say. There's a lot of credible people have seen it as well, which you can't ignore. And in a lot of the analysis just doesn't stack up, especially when you go back to the official American programs of the 40s and 50s and the kind of things they were trying to tell us that these things were when the information they were given, you know, you couldn't reach that kind of, uh, you know, a conclusion from the information that they had. It was just a almost a public relations exercise to say, look, we're looking at the problem, but actually there's nothing to see here, guys, you know, move along. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a, a public misconception is people don't really understand the distinction between evidence and proof and, or yeah. they, you know, or they dismiss evidence as being somehow not as important as proof. Um, like, for example, uh, I would use the example that, that, you know, we have we have a tremendous amount of evidence that quantum uh, quantum theory is correct, but we have no proof that quantum uh, yeah. quantum mechanics is is correct. But we have a lot of evidence that you know we can make predictions and we can build technologies based on it. But uh, we That's don't right. really we don't really know fundamentally how it works or if it is correct in, at all but you and know, yet you a, don't have the you don't have you know half of twitter you don't have the media you don't have you know everybody and his and his dog basically lining up to have a go at these scientists and saying you're wrong you know that's there's no proof you know you don't know what you're talking about and making jokes about them there's none of that in that field or very little yeah. whereas, well starting you know, i think it's starting to happen in the kind of string thing. theory people yeah <laughs> Right, is it? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> they're getting funny. a, f- they're getting, yeah, they're getting a few attacks these days. Uh, right, but it's nothing on the scale that we're getting, though, is it? So, no, not at all. Yeah. No, and it, yeah, <laughs> and it's and and it's the lack of you know, and the, and the response to uh, you know, like people who disagree with string theory, the response is to is to put forward other theories, and and people who want to take issue with string theory actually look at the data and study the results and and but the people who want to take issue with the ufo uh uh phenomena uh just say i will not look at anything until there is proof which is an odd an odd way for a scientist to approach any subject and i think it's a lack of um, and when you look at a lot of the media kind of takes on it, they will, especially news anchors, they, they just make a joke of it because you can tell there's a lack of understanding or a lack of knowledge. Uh, and I think it's actually a lack of knowledge because they might have a kind of official idea about what's happening. And I'm no doubt whoever's, you know, the, the, the research uh, people behind the scenes will have given them some something to read uh, to, to introduce the item, but they won't have that much knowledge pro- you know, in all truth about the history and the rich history of ufology as well uh, and of sightings you know throughout the decades and, and the centuries even so until you have that you can't really i guess you know have a, a really informed opinion on it you have to have some kind of grounding in in the, in the subject you have to at least touch on the major cases um, and some of the minor ones as well but you have to have an idea of what's happened from from the start to finish you can't just cherry pick bits and go you know oh I've, I've seen that bit and that bit and therefore i don't believe it or as a lot of people have done they've come into the subject since 2017 since the release of those three videos by tom DeLong and his mates uh, to the stars uh, academy um, and a lot of people have come in since then and they've only looked at the, the modern day stuff as in you know the last six years they don't know what's happened beforehand and i would hope at some stage they, they, they do have the time and the inclination to look at the you know the earlier cases because as you say things that have happened years ago are happening now there's parallels um and you know history tends to go, go in cycles uh, there's nothing new under the sun i also you know but at the at the same time as a, as a historian on this topic and having done this level of research um in depth, uh, trying to separate fact from fiction, trying to separate myth from, you know, as much reality as we can, as we can ascertain in this case, um, you know, it's important to confront, you know, even recent, you know, uh, developments in this, in this story and in this topic. I'm curious, um, you know, where you stand on the, 
you know, on on the issue of like debris and do we have, do we not have, or or how much, I guess, evidence do you feel exists? Uh, we know we don't have proof, um, but I guess in terms of the way you weigh uh, these kind of, you know, you, you take accounts from pilots, like you're really trying to kind of gauge, um, there's been a lot of everybody's kind of supposed to jump in lockstep and take everything uh, David Grush says, and I have no reason to doubt him. Um, yeah. But I'm also like, I also think it's important to look at everything with as much scrutiny as possible. Uh, where do you feel we are in terms of the evidence on uh, that the government has debris or stuff from crash sites? There's a lot of stories over the de- over the decades. So from Roswell, and actually probably before there's been things allegedly, you know, falling on the earth. So whether uh, they are crashes as, uh, you know, because of mechanical failure or whatever, or pilot error, um, if you can call them pilots, or because or some people nowadays say that there might be gifts to us. Um, and I've never really understood that one, but there you go. Um, whichever way it, you, know, you look at it, there's lots of stories over over the years as to things that have crashed here, there, and everywhere, not just in the States, but but other countries around the world. So if that's true, then there must be a pile of debris, if not intact craft, sitting in various places around the world. Now, that's evidence of the sort because they're stories. But then when you get to documentation and you get to actual proof, it, you know, you just don't have that yet. Um, and I guess Roswell's the most famous one. And like a lot of people, probably you guys, I've looked, you know, I've read the books about it. I've even, well, I've even been there as well. Um, and I'm still no further forward at the end of the day as to how true that story is. It's one of those ones that obviously I'd love to be true. But unfortunately, starting off at a position when I first started reading about it back in, was it 1980, I think, when the Roswell incident came out. And then the successive books and the, and the people who did the research into it, like Kevin Randall, afterwards, it got to a point where it was a peak where you thought, this is definitely coming together. And yet some of the, the witnesses turned out to be fraudulent. There were people who were inserting themselves into the story. Mm. So they, for whatever reason, they felt they could have a little bit of fame or intention themselves. So that kind of muddies the waters a bit. And it's only it only takes a few people, and it was literally just a few people, to actually cast doubt. And, and certainly other people who may have a less um, sort of, you know, a much less kind of belief of, of Roswell, that's going to make them think, well, is the rest of the story, you know, kind of kosher as well. And I still think there's something to it, but I'm not entirely sure how much, you know, what degree there is of truth behind it all. Um, so that you know, it's one of those things that the more you, you read, the more you hear, the less you understand. And I'm at the point now where, a bit like the Bob Lazar sto- uh, story, that I just don't know. And I think that's you know where I am now. And Bob Lazar especially, because he's one of these people that when he came out, he was in the right place at the right time, had this amazing story. Um, and I remember, you know, first hearing about it and just going, what? You know, yes. and, and like a lot of people, you know, this kind of incre- you know, being incredulous when you when you, when you heard about this this story about him being uh, at uh, S four in Area fifty one, and yet over the years, people, you know, for whatever reason, have chipped away at his story. They've obviously he's not perfect. He's not a perfect human being. Um, you could argue that he's the he's the ideal patsy for somebody who might be involved in a project like that because of his past of his history um, and all this baggage he has around him. Now, that doesn't mean to say he wasn't involved with a program like that, but also he's the perfect person to deflect attention away from, you know, because, well, how can he be part of a project like that when he's got all this other stuff going on? And the fact that he doesn't have a record at MIT, apart from, um, you know, listing that he apparently t- attended some lectures or, or what have you, but he wasn't on any of the, you know, any of the proper programs there. Right. Um, and a whole lot of other stuff going on as well, which casts doubt on his entire story um and it comes down to the end of the day as to what you want to believe because there's it's it's not riddled with holes but there's a few things that don't quite add up um and the same with roswell but unfortunately that's the same with a lot of stories in ufology and it's just the way it is and you have to kind of navigate your way around those and try and get as much truth or as much evidence as you can um and then 
you know, the, the hopefully the other the holes will sort of fall away on their own, but a lot of them don't because they're, they're persistent little buggers and they stay in the story. And it ju- it just still makes you think. Well, okay, we've got everything here. This is great in terms of pushing the UFO narrative, but this other bit, I'm not sure about that. And I'm afraid there are just too many stories like that still where. You know, it, you know, we want them to be true, and some of us desperately want them to be true. And the people who desperately want them to be true are blinded to the other things, which are maybe you know a little bit suspect. So I just, ha- you, I think you should just be as objective as you can, be as realistic as you can, and you know, come to the point of well, not everything about a case can be perfect, and unfortunately, you might get to a really good case initially. But actually, it turns out to be a, a crock of well, you know, SH one T. So, well, I'm I'm, I'm curious who was uh, you when you say some people involved with the Roswell story were discredited. Would it be any of the major? There's players? a guy who came out with a di- yeah. There's a guy who came out with a diary, um, and that turned out to be false. Mm-hmm. There's a guy called Kaufman, I believe. He was a bit suspect, and then there's Glenn, Glenn Dennis, the mortician. Uh, he mm-hmm. sent investigators out on a on a on a on a, a, a wild goose chase with the name of the nurse that allegedly told him about the child sized coffins and and the, and the bodies and that kind of thing. So you know he the the, the uh, Kevin Randall and his colleagues were looking for this nurse because he gave him a false name, um, and and then you know, didn't expect them to find them. And there was all this kind of cock and bull story about, oh, why are you giving you a false name for and all this sort of thing. And I think when people start doing stuff like that, it just makes you wonder as to how kind of truthful they are in everything else they're saying. Uh, because if you're going to you know, start to spin things out a bit or, 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 you, or sort of wrap yourself in, you know, in, in knots, just try to like tell one part of the story. Uh, because you might think it sounds good, or because you maybe want to deflect attention away from something else, then you know what else are you trying to hide? So it just mm-hmm. sort of takes a shine off somebody as a witness who originally sounded like a really good witness. You know, turns up with a, he gets a phone call, come along. Here, what size coffins do you have? Um, can you come to the? You know, can you come to the base? Yeah, yeah, all this kind of stuff. And then he comes up with a story that he meets a nurse and yada yada yada. Uh, and it just sort of, yeah, it, it just takes the it just takes the edge off the story a bit for me. I'm afraid. I think that's. I, I think it's important to you know uh, look at it this way, you know, because it's it's it, there's no question in my mind because when you when you kind of go like macro and you look at the entire totality of the history of UFOs, it's it's hmm. to me kind of beyond, and it must be to you, Graham, after having done all this. I mean. People have seen, it's like there is something in the skies people have seen for decades and decades, centuries perhaps. So, and yet, you know, you kind of narrow down on some of these really sort of like choicest bits and they, and yes, there's Mm. sometimes like it, it kind of crumbles under the hot spotlight. And that's what's so maddening and seductive about this topic is, you know, I can hear personal abduction stories and be just, just riveted and and convinced of the authenticity of the of the person yeah. and their story and yet there are these um you know the as the, the 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 big story being written right now um almost daily weekly like new you know this and and the organization and and people sort of coming to the topic i just think it is important to you know to 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 be you know to scrutinize what we're hearing and and mm. and, and judge it i don't it think there should it. be any sacred cows at all you know in ufology there shouldn't be any kind of case where you can't criticize it you can't uh, if you discover something that's wrong with it you shouldn't tell anybody you know you have to um because we have to have to we have everybody has to be honest about you know what they're looking at and because otherwise you know there's no, there's no way forward and we're not going to make any progress and in the ufos before roswell there's one it's not a celebrated case but it's one that's appeared in a few books and i looked at it and i looked into the background of it and i looked into the background of the pilot and where he said he was which unit he flew with and all this sort of thing and i found he wasn't even with a squadron at the time uh mm-hmm. you know, of the of the so-called incident so it's a kind of it leaves you thinking uh, you're sort of asking yourself, well, how does he? How was he there? 
you know, how does he know that information? How can he say he was flying with that squadron at the time and he saw this this object when clearly he wasn't because uh, the records state that he moved on? So, and there's a, there's a few other things that I, I sort of draw attention to uh, because I think it's helpful. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to debunk cases. I mean, that's not my object, but I'm just trying to tell the truth about things because I think as a historian, that's obviously really important. Um, but yeah. then the next thing is the myths that build up because the internet's a great place to propagate myths. You know, at one time you had to read them in books, and it, it was a you know very limited readership. Whereas now, you know, anybody around the world can can read about things that are you know sort of put up as a purported uh, reason for the Foo Fighters, let's say. Whereas you know when you look into them, they're nothing of the sort. So um, you know those things have to be looked at as well and, and explained. Speaking to that, just you mentioned German tech uh, as something mm. that was kind of on the other side. It was sort of that was a, a way to kind of dismiss either the Foo Fighters or, or ships that or yeah. things that people were seeing in time in the world. Can you talk about what that mythology is of this sort of German technology or they were making their own specialized yeah, futuristic a lot, ships? Yeah, a lot, a lot of that built up after the war. So there's no records during the war that anybody's been able to sort of find that have borne bought any kind of scrutiny uh, of the Germans building flying discs, for instance, because there's a huge Nazi flying saucer myth out there. Um, and it's quite, it, it's, it's lasted a long time. I mean, I first remember reading about it back in 1982. So that, that you know, that dates me. Um, um, in a book about airplanes, for, about German jet airplanes, what, would you believe? It wasn't anything to do about UFOs, but that's where it cropped up. Uh, and there'd been books before that, even from the 1950s, that had um, sort of touched on this. But it all goes back uh, to newspaper reports in Germany in, 19, in the 1950s, in about 1950, 1951, 1952, where people were coming out of the woodwork saying, I worked on German flying disc programs during the war. Um, you know, I'm looking for the Americans to take me to America to work on 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 America on projects of aircraft across there. And what in one particular case, he reckoned he was a, a, a test pilot for Henkel, one of the big German aircraft manufacturers during the war. Well, there's no record of him ever being a test pilot for them. Uh, in reality, after the war. He reckoned, well, he, he said he was an engineer, but really he was delivering newspapers for the U.S. Army in, in the occupied part of Germany. So, you know, that's what, if he was some kind of high performing engineer who had come up with some radical disc shaped airplane with some amazing kind of propulsion system, uh, which could, you know, obviously no wings, no propellers, no, well, no jets, presumably, then what was he doing delivering newspapers for the army? Why wasn't he, why hadn't he been taken up by paperclip, which was the, the brain drain of um, German rocket and air, aeronautical scientists and, and de designers and engineers? Why wasn't he taken over to America in 1945 and 1946? You know, why was he still languishing in, in Bremen in 1951 and then writing things to the newspaper saying, you know, people have been approaching me about uh, interesting in my ideas. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, of course, if you're going to tell this amazing story, people are going to want to know, but they're going to find out very quickly that you're telling a whole load of, you know, just porky pies kind of thing. So uh, yeah. it didn't go anywhere. But there was I, other people at the same time did. Yeah, the, well, the British and the Americans put a lot of resources into intelligence gathering uh, during the war. They did. And, and shortly after they it. Did. Yeah, so they, they, they knew a great deal about who what scientists were doing what within Germany. Uh, oh, and yeah. It, and, and, and early, other, 19, uh, early 1944, yeah. Yeah, and a pretty good bit, bit of evidence that, that, you, that the Germans hadn't mastered, uh, you know, anti-gravity and UFO technology. Uh, they lost. <laughs> they uh, lost, yeah, that's a big uh, one, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> I think that, I think, yeah, I think that uh, had they really had this tech... Um, we might we might be a little careful about what we say about Hitler right now. <laughs> well, we'll, be con we'll be conducting this conversation in German anyway. Oh yes, anyway, yes. So. and very respectfully of the in the in memory of the Fuhrer. It I mean, going back to early 1944, the, the, the Americans and the British actually had teams of people who were assigned to see what they were going to look at after the end of the war. They were, you know, they were compiling lists of factories, of research facilities, and they knew what they were doing at these places. So it wasn't as if there was very much that was in the way of secret. Uh, and then, of course, as, um, as the war ended, you know, they had jeep loads and truckloads of people going around Germany descending on these places and just pulling them apart, taking away anything that was of value, 
uh, questioning everybody who they could grab that, you know, grab a hold of. And there's this, you know, report after report that you can actually read if you know where to look for these things. Uh, they're called BIOS and SIOS reports for anybody who's interested. Um, it's the British Intelligence um, Objective Subcommittee or the um, combined, the same thing, uh, Combined Intelligence Operation uh, Objective Subcommittee for the American side. And there's thousands of reports, not just thousands of pages, but thousands of reports. Um, and they go from everything from dentistry to metallurgy to you know aeronautics to rocket uh, rocket research to everything that Germans were working on. So if there'd been anything that had been you know kind of specialized that might have explained the Foo Fighters or they were working on disc shaped airplanes, it would have been there. But it's not. Um, yeah, you so def- that's you know yeah. that's the thing. I know there's all those those um, uh, terrible uh, t- TV documentaries that talk about the Nazis and UFOs. There's always that mm. that that thing that, where they'll say that uh, the V two bomb the V two bomb uh, was uh, rockets were uh, were were achieved through uh, alien uh, intervention and alien uh, guidance, and they were they were leading the German scientists to create this technology. And, and I was that, that that seems a little odd since rocketry is kind of something that the the Chinese worked out the basics of it a very very <laughs> long time ago, and I'm not sure why why yeah. aliens would come down and <laughs> start explaining how rockets work. Yeah, yeah. I used to there was a um, there was a VHS and that game that dates me again uh, documentary. It was uh, UFO Secrets of the mm. Third Reich. I think it was from the early 1990s. And it was a, just a weird and wonderful look at this subject. And at one point they said, you know, about the Germans having contact with people from Aldebaran. And that's when I went, right, that's going to be switched off right now. Because <laughs> yeah. it was just wasn't yeah. worth bothering any further with. Because they did jump the shark, as, as they say. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough that most of my video library is on wax cylinders. So, uh, yeah, so. <laughs> so true. stone tablet. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. Um, and speaking of, uh, I guess, you know, my- mythology and stories and, and what are we, and uh, again, I kind of rely on your, uh, you know, research and expertise on this. You know, we, we heard a lot about this ship uh, that was recovered in 1933. David Grush brought it up in front of Congress um, or the committee. Um, what kind of evidence do we have for that? Uh, or do we have evidence for that? I mean, w- 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 we certainly don't have proof. We don't have the ship, but mm-hmm. where do you fall on that um, yeah, was, was story? Was the story circulating before Grush? Yeah, uh, it was. Yeah, there's. Um, it's been around for a little while. Um, yeah, so a couple of decades at least. Um, and yes, there is evidence of a, of a sort in terms of um, you know sort of telegrams, letters uh, that are on official kind of telegram paper or note paper from back then, but. That unfortunately doesn't necessarily mean that they were from the time, and they have been sort of independently looked at by an expert. But I think they need more kind of independent experts because it depends. You know, you can have an expert. It could be somebody who you may you may get along to actually tell your side of the story. It should be somebody else. I think it should be maybe best of three, if you like, um, because. There's a few things in that it didn't quite add up for me, but that doesn't mean to say it didn't happen. And it's one of those where it's a, at the moment, it, it's a lovely story, but you need more evidence and we need a bit more around it as to where, you know, where it ended up. They need a bit of a paper trail. And for the, for the, the story to say, well, look, the Americans got it um, because it, 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 it fluctuates as to, do they, or were the OSS involved? That's a, pre-runner to the the CIA um, did they parachute people in to to grab it uh, that's another story I've heard um, you just hear also so many things around it that it doesn't quite fit in with everything else that's happening um, so you know it's quite an outlier in some respects this particular story and the ha- there are other stories of things being retrieved in the 30s. Um, there's a story. There's a there's a story about something co- coming down in Poland as well that the Germans might have got a hold of, but you see the, these stories don't have legs. Um, that they, they don't. Um, you know, there's not much more to them. Um, so at the moment, all we know is that this thing was supposed to either crashed or landed. Uh, it was. You know, so, somehow the Italians got it. They, for whatever reason, they didn't 
look at it too much because it probably because they didn't understand it and it was put in an aircraft hangar uh, the, the Sia Marchetti uh, aircraft company at their their place uh, up in northern Italy and it was just left there by all accounts um so uh, the bit that doesn't that doesn't add up to me is that the Germans and the Italians were allies and they were exchanging information on aeroplanes and, and uh, technology so why didn't the Germans get involved why wasn't it spirited to Germany um, you know, okay, the the south uh, of, of Italy they surrendered in forty three, uh, but the north still carried on under the fascist republic, and that's where this thing was allegedly. So why didn't the Germans grab it? Because they must have fa- you would have thought they would have found out about it at some stage. So that's not quite sort of you know I, I just wonder about that. Um, and then we've got the bits about alternatively the OSS going to grab it or the the, the U.S. Army picking it up but then there's no stories about you know the people who did that because you would think that would be a big thing and that might have come out somewhere so i think there's a lot more work needs to be done on this story to actually make it sort of hold up a bit more than it has it already but that's not to say it's not true because you know tomorrow there could be a whole load of information that comes out and goes you know oh right that's definitely something that's happened uh so you can never write something off it's just another mm-hmm. one of those where you just have en- there's just enough doubt in my mind to think, well, I don't know. And I think that's maybe the best thing I can say is I, I, I simply don't know. And yeah. my only kind of fear is that it's not something that David Grush was actually involved with and that, you know, he was actually actively investigating or had information, kind of, you know, documentation pushed under his nose to say, look, you review this, David. It's, I don't know if you've ever seen, if you've ever read Nick Cook's book, The, the Hunt for Zero Point. Um, no. He talks about um, the, well. The last thing he talks about is the is the, the De Glocker, the Bell. You know that supposed anti gravity project that the Germans were supposed to be working on at the end of the war. But earlier in the book, uh, one of his sources, uh, one of his aviation sources, comes up with this thing called the legend inverted commas, and it's supposed to be the the narrative of what happened from the sort of thirties through the forties, fifties, sixties, etc. In terms of UFOs. And I just hope it's nothing to do with this, because that seemed a bit exaggerated for me, that the way it was portrayed by, by Nick Cook's source. Um, and it also meant, you know, it, it might be all wrapped up with German flying saucers and all the rest of it. And I just hope it's not kind of a, a made up thing in the background that, you know, people sort of latch onto and somehow information from it ends up in the intelligence community and they you know because they don't have much to work with it's just one of those things that gets perpetuated i really hope it's not something like that mm-hmm. you know i would like to think that people like that wouldn't get involved with that kind of stuff but you never can tell and, uh, well, also but that's the, not to say that you know it could well be true and this is also the interesting angle of the of the the pope facilitating the transfer of the of the material if that's yeah that, yeah. that, that the Vatican was directly involved in moving the material from Italian uh, provenance to American, mm. uh, which would be interesting. I don't, it, it just, yeah, it's interesting, but it's one of those stories where, you know, it, it's almost, you, well, what, what's the German thing that used to have, like, you know, the, the, you, you hide a, a lie between two truths, don't you? Um, and I don't know. At the end of the day, Dave, Tom, I, I'm not sure about it. You know, I can't, mm-hmm. I can't say it's true. I can't say it's false. There's just a few things in it that just don't add up for me in the overall context of the time uh, and the place and the people who possibly were involved with it. Um, until we get more information, I think that's how I would leave it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I this I think it's critical that we that uh, you know we're we we for, we all are involved in this topic in one way or another kind of all the time. Graham, you've done so much you know a lot more research. We, we're having conversations with people you know, and it's just important to kind of look up above the trees every once in a while and just be like, okay, well, what is what has been sort of more verified? What is a little loose? What is some you know? And it's like you can uh, just continue to kind of get things. It can get become a little bit of an echo chamber. And I think it's really important for people yeah. that have, you know, what? deeply yeah. studied this topic to be able to, you know, engage with, uh, you know, as much reality as we can on this. And um, it, because it's an f- incredibly fascinating topic, it is the story of the millennia and it has to, but it also is <laughs> so uh, fraught with, um, you know, uh, voices and stories and and myth and and uh, because of its elusive nature, it's just um, you know it's so and sometimes, important. To be- sometimes sometimes you have to prune a tree to keep it healthy. 
And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and, yeah. I think, and I think the work you're doing is, is, is a lot of it is, you know, pruning the, the things that are falsifiable um, so that people can focus on and, and, you know, on, on what is still remains a mystery. Um, mm. And I think people, you know, I think it's right for people to say, look, I don't know at the end of the day, you, you don't have to come down to one side or the other. You can right. just take a middle ground. Um, and there's always going to be cases where they just don't go anywhere, but there's other ones which will get extra information as the years go on because people do dig up things. So you just, just basically, you know, people just wait, you have to be patient. Um, and if you, if there's not enough information there to lead you a conclusion, then it's all right to say, well, at the moment, I'm not sure. But I'm happy to wait for further developments. You know, there's nothing wrong with that at all, uh, and that's yeah. my my kind of position with a lot of what what's you know what's mentioned nowadays. It's just I'm I think I'm old enough and maybe what maybe not wise enough, but you know, sort of mature enough to think. Yeah, I can do. I, I'm happy to wait. I'm not I'm not going to come down on one side or the other. I'm not that you know sort of certain. You know, because nothing's certain in ufology. If it's one thing I've ever learned yeah. here, that nothing that you read, you should take at face at face value. Mm-hmm. And it also, I think it's important for people to remember too that 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 a disreputable or a dishonest source doesn't negate uh, another source. It's not like you go, nope. you know, if there's one dishonest uh, bit of testimony or one dishonest bit of research, that it must all be dishonest. Um, like, I mean, we're, we're in the entertainment business and I, whenever a, a very famous person dies, there are tons of people who try to attach themselves to that person and tell stories yeah. that are clearly not true. Uh, but then, but then the fact still remains that Robin Williams existed. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't nothing, it doesn't cancel everything, which I don't think people need to be that no. sensitive about, um, about you know being critical of, of some of the of the stories and some of the legends yeah hundred I, I agree yeah. yeah and I think the um, I mean I would love to I will will we're gonna also let you get some sleep Graham at some point you know but <laughs> yeah I am yeah. curious with it's, with all uh, of you know you've got this great so you've got a great set of volume of books uh, that cover you know this period from um, like 1940 now to almost to 19 is it up to like 1955 in terms of these um, it's 1956 is up to 1956. Now, yeah. yeah. Is there is there a is there a favorite or two that you that you weren't yeah. aware of before you jumped into this research in depth? Did you find what did was there yeah. anything that you found that is sort of stands out as a as a favorite um, story or or sighting that uh, that you can that you can tell us about? Perhaps something from the new book Chasing Shadows, which people should buy. Oh. I was going to say, I was going to go, actually, I was going to go back. I was going to, I'll leave, I'll leave everything in Chasing Shadows for the reader just to, to go. Oh, I'll right. go back Fair a enough. Bit. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the book I'm still probably the happiest with is Dawn of the Flying Saucers. And that's the one that tells the, the story of um, just before Kenneth Arnold's sighting. So actually 1946 with a, with a couple of Swedish sightings and then um, the, 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 a few just before Kenneth Arnold. But then it also tells the story of uh, Project, you know, Project Sign, Project Grudge as well. So that's the, the early attempts to try and make sense of it all. Um, and actually, a few things that happened before Project Sign as well, uh, just to te- you know, just to weave those in with a narrative of the aerial incidents. And I'll, I guess one that I had actually come across, but I wasn't really aware of too much detail back in the day, was uh, George Gorman's um, sort of uh, kind of, for want of a better word, call it a dogfight. So we're getting back to this kind of thing with a, with a tic tac, you know, you know, chasing um, chasing UFOs round and round in circles. And he was flying a, an F-51 Mustang um, uh, at Fargo uh, at, um, in North Dakota. Um, and he was coming into land with three other aircraft after uh, on a nighttime training flight. And he still has fuel, so he stays up in the circuit. So he has, you know, he has fuel to burn, so he's going to fly around a bit more and get some night uh, flying practice in. And as he's looking down at the lights of the town below him or the city below him, he sees this light flying really quickly. And it's not an aeroplane because there's an, you can see another airplane nearby that's coming into land. So he, he radios the tower and says, I'm going to break off this, this training flight I'm on. I'm going to go and investigate this, this light that's flying. Um, so he, got, he, he follows it and then it basically makes head on passes at him. So it, it flies right at him. And the first time it flies right at him, he chickens out basically because he thinks it's going to hit him. 
um, because it's coming straight at his nose. So he dives out the way and it flies over the top of him. Then the second time it does the head on pass, he then holds his ground and he stays where he is and it just shoots straight over over the top of the airplane. Um, And he then tries to follow it. So he puts the aircraft up into a climb, but he he runs out of power because uh, it's going much quicker than he is. Uh, and it can sustain this rate of climb where he's in a propeller driven airplane. It's only got a limited amount of power when it's going straight upwards. And it gets to the point where it gets in what they call an engine stall, which means the air- aircraft can't deliver enough power to keep it flying upwards. It just falls away. Um, so he, he manages to, to recover from the spin. But then there's a third attempt with this this thing, this, this light to try and, you know, sort of have a go at him, if you like. It, it makes a real close pass and then it just disappears. He gets back on the ground, and, and the, the analysis after this event is that the, he was not chasing nothing more than the weather balloon. That's what the official story was. Um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so it, it's it's absolutely crazy. Uh, so, you know, so it's just one of those stories. And there were other stories like that at the time where there were strange objects in the vicinity of airfields uh, and pilots either seeing them or being asked to, to look at them or, or just seeing them again and again and not knowing what they were and then being written off as mundane items uh, in what, you know, in either there were weather balloons in one case next to the border. I think it was this one, you know, oh, that was an errant Royal Canadian Air Force aircraft which had decided to come over the border and, and just beat up the circuit at the, at the airfield, you know, sort of thing, which that wouldn't happen, you know, in the national incident. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of thing, especially so. not from Canadians. <laughs> I just have to well, say. Well, yeah, you're more reserved, aren't you? You're not going to do that, are you? No, you know, we're not so. hot dogs. We're not no. hot doggers, Canadians. <laughs> Very polite. Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah. things were written off in weird and wonderful ways um, back then. But it does often seem like the, sometimes it seems like the best evidence for the, for the existence of UAP uh, is the debunking, is the official explanations. I mean, the, 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 the absurdity of some of the explanations oh, sometimes yeah. feels like it's the strongest uh, evidence for, for this being a serious <laughs> and, and real uh, issue. And it did with Blue Book, because Blue Book was the one that basically made it into an art form, if you like. So it got to the point where, in about the time frame when I'm talking about in Chasing Shadows, is that one the, the person who was in charge of it at that time, anything that appeared as a balloon in the, uh, in the reporting or the analysis, even if it was a case of, oh, there was a balloon launched three hours afterwards, that was almost enough for him to go, it was a balloon. And then yeah. basically say, right, that case is solved because he was booking for a promotion. He was booking for a transfer away from Blue Book. That was just a stepping stone to something you know, bigger and better for him. So the more he could say to his superiors, you know, I've sold all these cases, all, all these cases have been, you know, sort of um, you know, worked out on my watch, then that was better for him. He wasn't bothered about whether it was true or not, or whether it, it was a proper explanation or not, as long as it was mm-hmm. stamped solved. That was enough for right. him. Yeah. So, and you had when you say like him, that, can you just placeholders? When you when you say him, you're talking about the uh, the, the 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 officer in charge of Blue Book, or yeah, or the Ryan. officer in charge at that time. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah. It was called uh, Gregory. Yeah, he was uh, he was one of those. So there was yeah, a few as people. well. Yeah, Quintanilla, yeah, and, and they were only uh, short term as well. Um, yeah, they didn't last long. Yeah, you know, yeah, and again, eventually, I guess it was. Uh, Heineck was put in a position where he galled himself into becoming uh, an advocate for uh, for. And we all know the words swamp gas. <laughs> yeah, yes, and his breaking point. And I think it's even, always swamp gas. Even he obviously came to realize that it just wasn't on, and I think that was probably the beginning of the end for him. Um, and obviously, mm-hmm. he wrote you know best-selling books in the early nineteen seventies, which effectively turned his previous position on its head and he became an advocate you know, for, for more information yeah. and for getting to the bottom of it, whereas he was basically coming up with everything under the sun to try and dismiss it based on, on you know, almost instructions from above saying, this is what you're going to do. Um, you have to debunk these at any costs. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, I wouldn't have liked to be put in that position myself. And I think I would have just walked away. But for whatever reason, you know, he stayed for, for some time but then had to leave because it was just untenable. 
Well, for all those, uh, for the fact that in maybe some of our favorite stories, there are some holes that can be poked, uh, it does not um, dismiss the fact that there is just so much history of lying, of the government lying about what has been happening out there, just just decades of lies and and structured lying and programs designed to lie about it. So, um, yes, the the mystery indeed persists. But um, let let us again recommend. Uh, I'm reading UFOs before Roswell about the European Foo Fighters. That covers 1940, 1945. Um, there's uh, several yeah. books now by Dawn of the Flying Saucers. Graham Rendell, Dawn of the Flying Saucers. Mm-hmm. There's an and there's the new one out is called Chasing Shadows. Chasing Shadows. Um, it's just a. It's just a. A very readable, engaging, suspenseful collection of just extremely well-researched, um, you know, stories of engagements and sightings through pilots and and military people, and and um, uh, just fascinating. And we really are grateful for you staying up to talk with us um, and in, and enduring <laughs> enduring all of our you know falcors and and lightings and yeah. who we love. Um, but uh, it was really great to to meet you and speak mm-hmm. with you about yes. this and we hope to do it again yeah, sometime guys. yeah i've, yeah, I've been I follow, following you, you on I'm, i follow you on whatever twitter is and instagram and always really yeah. enjoy your posts so, yeah and yeah, and and Thank we you. finally and, and we finally gotten rid of the delay so i think it's a good time to probably end this <laughs> excellent <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much graham thank you so much oh, you're yeah, welcome great thanks to meet very you. much yeah cheers thank you